Um, Joe joins us today from Parakeet Software down in Los Gatos. Uh, we've, uh, Joe's been here before showing a, an earlier version of Firebug. And now I think uh, we're ready to take a look at Firebug 1.0. Okay. Am I on here? Am I on? Okay, yep. good. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I guess a lot of you have probably used Firebug, so today I'm not really going to give like a, a high-level overview. Um, I don't even have any slides, actually. It's kind of going to be like Sports Center. I'm just going to show you the highlights. Um, just going to go through a whole bunch of stuff that I think um, features that I think not everyone knows about, and maybe some people know, do know about, but um, a lot of the stuff that is in Firebug. <laughs> Firebug is pretty uh, obvious how it works. I mean, the tabs pretty much give away the high-level stuff. So uh, I'm going to start with some of the stuff that, that happens uh, that you might not notice. So the first thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about here is in the HTML tab. Um, this is kind of under the topic of, of change. Um, OK, so um, Firebug basically exists for two reasons. Um, one is to show you what's going on in your page when it loads. Um, the other is to show you what happens after the page loads, uh, how things change, events that come in, and so on. Uh, so one of the uh, neat features in Firebug 1.0 that wasn't in there before is that when you make a change to the HTML DOM, uh, which is the, you know, the, fundam the foundation of what everyone does in AJAX, in the old version, nothing happened. You didn't see anything. You had to basically reload the page to see it. But in, um, in the new version, what happens, bring up, I'm going to be using some YUI uh, example projects for this today. What I'm going to do here is this is a tab widget from YUI. Uh, you know, as I, um, I'm going to inspect one of the tabs here. And as I go and click on them, you can see that the um, highlighted part in yellow there shows you what's happened as I click. It highlights the class is changed to um, selected, the title is changed to active. So that's a nice way to see um, that your changes have actually taken effect. Um, you can also see when um, new content has been inserted into the DOM. Here's, um, here's an example project of the, uh, the log reader. So every time I click on this button here, you see it appends some uh, elements to the top of this, this log. And you can, if you want to actually confirm that that happened, you, know, you can highlight the part of the DOM here that, that is about to be affected. And now when I, when I click this button, you can see the yellow part. Those are the elements that have been inserted. You can, uh, you can confirm that here just by going down into the, uh, into the tab and moving your mouse over them. If you notice up there, they're highlighted as you move over them. OK. So on to the next highlight. Um, so what I'm going to show now is the uh, JavaScript profiler. The, um, the profiler basically is a toggle. It's either on or off. And while it's on, all the JavaScript that gets executed in the page is being measured how many times functions were called, um, how long each function took. And you do that by clicking the, um, the profile button here in the console. And you can, you can see what's happening. So let me go to a better example here. Here's the, uh, the autocomplete widget. Am I better now? Yeah. I heard it louder. Yeah. OK. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to try to measure here is, is how much uh, JavaScript is being, being run when I type a single character in this, this text field. So you turn the profiler on, and I'll type something. Oh, whoops. Left some debugging code in. Apologies. Let's try that again. OK. You turn the profiler on and do something. And you turn it off. And you get this nice little report here, which shows you all the functions that were called. Here's the, here are the functions on the left. Um, and these are you know, some statistics about them. And you can sort these. Um, there's an important difference here to be aware of, which is the difference between the uh, time and the own time column. Uh, time tells you how much time was spent inside of the function, including uh, other functions that it, it calls within itself, whereas own time 
is the actual time spent executing uh, sort of individual statements that don't recurse into other functions. So that's probably the more interesting one, which is why this percentage column here is uh, the default column, and that tells you the um, basically the percentage of, of time that this own time column here took up. So looking at this report here, you can see you know, right off the bat that this print to console function is you know, consuming 46% of the time. Um, it's probably why a lot of these uh, YUI example projects turn off the, um, the log reader, because that's taking a lot of time. So I'm going to see what happens if I disable the logging by unchecking these check marks. And then I'm going to run the profiler again. And you can see there's a bit of a difference. If I go back up here, um, this first one took 500 milliseconds. And oops, oops, where did it go? Sorry about that, left some stuff in here. Okay. I think you get the point. So that's um, the manual way to start the profiler, but I think that most people will find more value actually calling the profiler a different way, which is to actually insert calls to um, a function in your code that can limit the parts of your code that are being measured. Because you can, it's not always practical to actually manually uh, start the profiler at a point where you're interested in, in um, collecting the data. So what I'm going to do here is um, run this again. And I'll notice that this is one function here, populate list, say, that I'm interested in, um, in reporting. If you click the function, you can, uh, it'll actually take you over to the script tag, and it'll show you where the function exists in the code. So I can see it's in this autocomplete debug file. And I'm going to I have that conveniently open here. Um, and on line 1153 down here, the beginning of the function, I'm going to add uh, console dot um, profile and just a little caption there just to distinguish it. And then at the end of the function, when you're done with that, you just put console dot profile end. Now, So now, I don't have to click the profile button at all. I'm just going to hit this, and I get my report for that one keystroke. So that gives you a, a much, a much um, more select list of what's going on. OK. Now, one other way to, to interpret what's going on here is sometimes you want to see just what one particular function, when a particular function was called. Um, and what parameters were passed to it. I'm going to go over to this um, slider example here. And if I were to run the profile on the slider, I would see this is function at the top called get style, which is called 97 times. So when you're trying to figure out why it was called 97 times, if it happens to be causing a performance problem, what you can do is you can just um, right click on it. I'm sorry, you can click on it, it'll take you in here, and then you can just right click. And you'll see this option here at the log calls. So now what that's going to do is. Hold on a second. Okay, what that's going to do is now every time get style is called, you can see it dumped here a, a line in the, the log which shows not only that the function was called, but it shows the, um, the parameters to the function uh, in a fairly readable format. So you can see that the first parameter was a particular element um, with the name of the element format, and you can actually move your mouse over it and, and it'll highlight in the page which one it was, so you can visualize that. And you can also click these. Just about everything that you see in the console is a hyperlink and um, we'll take you to the appropriate place in Firebug to see more information about the object. So, 
Um, this is also a, a hyperlink here. This, the name of the function is a hyperlink to the function itself in the script tag. So that's always handy to keep in mind. Another type of thing that you can, you can log is you can um, get a log of, of events, DOM events, that have been sent to particular elements. Um, one question I had when I first looked at this was, when I click on it, it gets that little dotted line around it, which seems to indicate that it's focused. And I was wondering whether uh, YUI was actually using the browser's own focus system or some kind of hack which isn't the same. And some people have been known to do that. So the, the way to uh, answer that question is what you can do is you um, inspect an element somewhere in the vicinity of this slider here. And I'm going to right click on it and there's an option here to log events. In the old Firebug, there's a, actually a tab called Events, um, which I got rid of and, and just replaced it with this option. So now every event that goes to this horizontal wrapper element here is going to show up over here. And that's kind of a lot of noise. You've got mouse events and mouse move events and all kinds of stuff you don't want. But in, in this example, I'm just trying to see whether it actually gets focused. So I'm going to type in the quick search box, Focus, which filters the list. And now when I click on it over here, it's only going to show that particular event. So yes, you can see here it, it confirmed my suspicion that uh, Yahoo is doing the right thing here and actually <coughs> focusing the object. Now if you're curious to know more about these events after you've logged them, you can, again, you can click them. They're hyperlinks. I'll take you over here to the DOM tab and show you all the properties of the event object, which you can interactively explore some more. Now another kind of thing that you can um, that you can do here in the console uh, on the topic of of monitoring events. This is really one of the reasons that Firebug was created in the first place is to monitor uh, XML HTTP requests or XHRs. So I'm going to go over here to uh, an old copy of my blog, and what my blog has a little XML HTTP request commenting system. So at the bottom of each post. If you click on the name of the uh, of, click on the comments, it actually fetches a little XML file and um, displays. As you can see down here, it shows that I fetched that XML um, file. And if you expand it now, you can see a whole bunch of other stuff that came with the request. The actual body of the request, you can see the the, requ the response headers uh, and the request headers in a nice little table there, and the parameters, which are the uh, actual URL parameters. Um, if you're Amazon.com or something and you put everything in the URL, then that can be pretty a nicer way to read it than a big, giant, concatenated string. So that's probably one of the most popular um, features in Firebug. Now, another way that you can look at what's going on over the network, in addition to the, uh, the console here, this only shows you XML HTTP requests. But if you go over here to this net tab, the net tab shows you all network traffic that has gone on behind the page. Uh, all the JavaScript files, all the um, image files, and you can see right here is the request I just made for this XML file. And it, if I um, click to expand it, you know, I have the same, pretty much the same data. One of the nice things about this is that um, when you fetch things, when you update the page dynamically, you know, you're doing more than just fetching um, files over the XHR. Sometimes you're also adding um, some more images or maybe some more style sheets. So a nice way to see what's going on there. For instance, when I, um, where you're going to see when I click on this, so you're going to see three files come in here. And it, First there was the XML file, and then there were these two images, which are actually uh, background images you know, that are tiled horizontally here. You can see that the, uh, the timeline is adjusted slightly so that uh, after the load, everything on the timeline kind of creeped over this way, and then a few seconds went by before I got the new stuff and the timeline was adjusted just for that interval, um, that short interval when the load was made. And one, one more thing about this view, which is slightly off topic, but really my favorite thing about it is when you're, when you're writing a lot of JavaScript, the thing that I think most JavaScript programmers obsess over is how much, <laughs> how much JavaScript is in my page. You know, my download, making my users download three megabytes. Uh, and this is really, I used to use um, the web developer toolbar to get this information, but this is a little, a little simpler. You can actually just click on this JavaScript um, 
one of these buttons up here to filter by different file types. You can click on JavaScript, and you can see here just on this um, slider example for YUI that it's loading 331k of JavaScript, which is a lot because I'm not using their compressed versions. So this is a really nice way to get feedback if you're doing something to try to make the page smaller. I'm just going to change all these to load the uh, compressed <coughs> version. Now when I reload it, you know, r right away it's telling me that I'm only loading 125. Actually, I'm going to shift reload it. You can see, yeah, 125K. So that's a really nice way to get quick feedback on changes you're making to optimize your page. Now I'm going to um, change topics a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about how you can use Firebug. Oh, yeah. Um, he asked if um, the Net tab distinguishes between the um, the time to fetch the file and the time to render it. Uh, and the answer is no. It's pretty much the time to fetch it, for the most part. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit now about how you can use Firebug more for uh, for styling, for doing CSS types of things, um, and for or live editing of the document. So the first thing you need to know is, it may not be immediately obvious, but everything pretty much in, that you can edit in Firebug, um, that you could edit, you can edit. And you can just click on stuff to see if, that, if it brings up this little editor. So here in the CSS view, I can just click on anything here. And you can see it brings up that little edit box. And I can tap, um, tab around. The same thing in the HTML. Um, you can click on an attribute value or an attribute name. Um, if I tab around here, I can insert a new attribute this way, um, like that. And if you want to go a little bit more crazy with your HTML editing, you can actually select an element and hit this edit button here. And what that does is it gives you a way to edit pretty much the inner HTML or the outer HTML for the thing that is selected. And this you know, is pretty much as you type, you can see the header of the page there changing as I, as I type right away. And if you, um, if you just want to mess around and then you want to undo what you just did, just um, hit escape after you've made your changes and it'll put it back the way it was before. Now a lot of people um, are comparing Firebug to Dreamweaver because of this feature? I I wouldn't do that. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's n not trying to replace Dreamweaver here. The idea is that the 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 model for using this feature is you want to find out what effect something has, and you want to you know tweak it a little bit, and then you want to take the changes back over to your text editor, which might be Dreamweaver, um, and actually cement that change in, into place. So. Um, Directly editing a value is, um, there, are, there are a few different ways. There are, uh, the most popular for me personally, the, the main reason that I like to edit CSS is to align things, which means I'm normally editing numeric values. So if I'm wondering why something's one or two pixels off, um, not that there's anything here that's one or two pixels off, but um, let me see if I can find something. Um, okay, so this little links header here has a padding of one pixel. And if I'm curious, you know, what it would look like with a little more padding, what I can do is um, just use the arrow keys. You bring up the editor and use the arrow keys. So I can just hit, go up, 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 you know, and tweak it a little bit. And it's a lot easier to do that than actually typing the numbers because you can, you know, keep your eye on the thing that you're changing and not, not type. And that works for, you know, any, um, any number that you see, whether it's floating point, whether it's in the middle of... Um, of a list of other numbers. Let me see if I can find something. Okay. Yeah, like the margin, for instance, on this this paragraph here, you can see the different numbers. So I can just go in and put the cursor on any number in this list, and you can use the arrow keys. You can also use um, page up or page down to move it by larger amounts. What about color? Tell my to do, <laughs> tell my to do list. No, you can't. Yeah, I want to be able to like increase the hue or the saturation, but Firebug 2.0. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's a nice way to tweak. Another nice way to tweak is to use this little um, 
not sign that you see next to the property as you uh, move over it. That's a button you can click to just toggle the property off. So that's too subtle. Um, let's see. All right, say I am. Um, the text here is kind of a light gray, and I want to see, for instance, what would it be if I hadn't explicitly set it to light gray. So I just click that button, that disables it, and you can see the paragraph uh, change to black. You can also see um, down in the bottom of the style uh, tab there, you'll notice that it says inherited from body was the color uh, black. It's crossed out to show that it's been overridden by this property up here, which is more specific. And when you disable it, it removes that um, underscore so you can get an idea how the cascade is actually working kind of interactively. Okay. Now, this tab here is the layout tab, which gives you a little bit more of a visual indication of what your um, box model properties, like the margin and padding and, and positioning, are doing. Um, as you, um, you know, you can pretty much tell this is, you know, the top right, bottom left properties. And as you move over this section with your mouse, you'll notice that a ruler appears in the page. And that gives you a way to, to see where the um, box is positioned relative to its, its offset um, parent. If you're familiar in CSS, there's a concept of the offset parent, which if you happen to um, use relative or absolute positioning, you need to know what you're positioning relative to. So in this case, um, this box here, this paragraph, the ruler um, is around this area here because it's relative to this, this, to a little box that's over here. So when you're, this is especially handy when you're doing absolute positioning, so you can get a feel for, for um, the space that you're working in. Um, the other thing that's, that's neat here is that you'll notice that when I move over the, um, the area, this shaded box comes in here, which has different color-coded areas. The, um, the blue area in the center is the content, which you can see down here is 40 by 114. But that yellow bar on top represents the margin, um, which is 8 pixels here. Um, sometimes it's nice when you're trying to align things to have that box there. If I click on the top margin here of 8, and I, and I want to see what it would look like if it were maybe a little more or a little bit less, I can, you know, again, use the arrow keys here. And you can see the yellow bar is, is increasing to kind of visualize how things are lining up there. But if you take your mouse outside the layout tab, that goes away, and you can, you can see it without it. And if you were just messing around, you can just hit Escape again, and it'll put it back the way it was. Now, something I just added back in recently for, um, for popular, due to popular demand, is the, um, the computed style. This view of the style information here is showing you the cascade, the different rules, and how they uh, affect each other. And sometimes you just want to see, you know, what is the, what is the font family? Um, and you don't want to have to dig in these rules to see which one of these guys is setting the font family. So what you can do is just hit, in the options menu, just hit show computed style, and it'll change the view here. And now it's showing you kind of grouped by category some of the different, um, all of the different CSS properties and what their actual computed value is. And as always, you can, when you, um, when you hit the inspect button, you can move around here and you can see what particular things are as you move over them. So you can see that the fonts change as you touch them. Um, one other handy thing that you can do in here, which I use a lot, is um, sometimes when you put images in a document, you want to hard code the image size. Um, but you, I'm always forgetting, you know, how, you know, what was the actual size of that image? So a nice quick way to get that information now is you can just uh, inspect any image here in the document. And you'll see down here in the HTML view, you can just move your mouse over the actual um, source attribute, and it'll show you the actual width and height of the image right there. Uh, and that'll work whenever, wherever you see something referring to an image, be it in the HTML or the CSS view, um, like this one here. I can move over the, uh, this background here and it'll show me it with the width and height. Uh, this little tooltip here also works for colors. So you can move over a color here and you can see, see a little swatch.
Okay. And one last thing on this topic of, uh, of styling is um, I want to show how this, this style tab over here is different from the CSS tab on the left. Uh, this one here is obviously related to the selected element in the HTML view. It's showing you all the rules that apply to that element. But sometimes you want to go and you want to see some, something in the actual style sheet that's maybe nearby one of these rules and you're curious where that is. So you can see this link here which tells you where it is. You can actually click that. And again, everything is hyperlinked in Firebug. You can, it'll take you right here, briefly highlight the rule, and you can see it in the order that it was specified in the actual style sheet. Now if you want to edit it, just like in the HTML view, you can directly click things to edit them atomically, or you can hit this edit button up here, which will um, put the in original source of the style sheet. So if you have your own crazy CSS um, formatting conventions, you'll see them here, complete with all your comments. And you can edit this again and see your changes appear pretty much right away, like that. And again, it's not Dreamweaver, so it's just it's just handy. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I'm going to move on now to uh, JavaScript debugging. Okay. Now the old version of Firebug had a JavaScript debugger, which barely worked. I apologize for that. Um, this version, it actually works. So if you've been suffering with Venkman and the old Firebug, I hope that your life is a little easier now. Uh, the, the core thing that you do in um, JavaScript debugging is you set breakpoints, which are a way to tell the JavaScript interpreter to stop at a particular line. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, this is the Firebug website, and one thing it does here is as you move over, this is sort of like a live screenshot, and you can move over these tabs to kind of simulate what Firebug actually looks like in each tab. So if I were debugging this, and um, I wanted to see what was going on uh, when I clicked on a particular tab, I'm going to go down here in the script tab to the onClick function, and I'm just going to click over here on the line number, and you'll see that red dot, that indicates a breakpoint. So if you've ever used a debugger, that's, that's nothing, nothing new. So I'll just click on a button, and you can see the interpreter has stopped. There's a little arrow here to tell you of that. You can see over here in the watch tab that these are the local variables that are, that are um, defined here. And um, you can inspect these by expanding them. And all pretty obvious stuff. Uh, one thing that's new, though, here that I wanted to show is that there's a tooltip which can save you the trouble of having to crane your neck back and forth to look over at the watch tab. If you're reading the source here, and for instance, in this if statement here, it's checking to see what the class name of the image is. So you can just move your mouse over class name, and it'll actually show you the value of that. Or you can just move it over the image variable, and it'll show you the, um, the name of the, the element there. That works for, for any, um, any sort of dot separated JavaScript expressions. You just move over anything there. Now, a nice, sometimes you have a more complex expression that you want to look at, and you want to add um, what are called a watch expression. There are two ways to do that. This is new in this version. You can just click on new watch expression, which is fairly obvious, and then type it. Or what you can do is you can select something that's maybe already in your code that you're interested in looking at. Say I want to see what the value of this, this particular attribute is here since I'm checking it. I'm going to select it and then if you right click you can hit add watch and it'll show you that over here. So now I know that I clicked on the JS tab. Um, something that's nice about this, um, when you add something in the watch tab, it's basically a miniature um, JavaScript command line. And it does the same things that the command line does. For instance, it has autocomplete. So um, if, you're, if you just type W and then hit tab, it'll, it'll complete to window. Uh, if you type image and then don't type anything, you can hit tab and you can just hold that down to cycle through all the properties of image. Uh, if you hit escape, it'll just backtrack to the previous dot. Um, I think every, uh, every shell or command line has a different way of doing this. I'm not exactly sure why Firebugs works this way, but I hope you use whatever shell I use and you find this model familiar. 
Um, so I, again, I'll just type the same thing: image dot get uh, attribute. Uh, and even after the, even after a com more complex expression like this, you can continue to autocomplete. Like I can see, this is going to be a string, and I could see the length. Except that didn't work. <laughs> Another thing that's new here in version 1.0 is something called conditional breakpoints, which are nice for times when a breakpoint that you've set is being hit over and over and over again, and you're getting a little bit annoyed by that. There's only a specific case when you actually want it to stop. And so what you can do is you can just right-click over here on a line number, and it'll bring up this little pop-up. You can type in any JavaScript expression that evaluates to true or false there. So, say in this case, um, I actually let me do something more interesting. When I uh, mouse over each one of these tabs up here, it's calling this function on mouse over tab. But it can get a little bit annoying if it's uh, constantly breaking for all the different tabs, and I'm only in interested in a specific tab. So, what I'm going to do is right click over here, and I'm going to say only break if the image has an attribute with a tab name of CSS. So now, when I mouse over DOM and net, nothing happens. When I mouse over CSS, it actually stops. And once you're, um, now once you're actually stopped here, sometimes you want to move you know, line by line. Um, these buttons here, step over, step into, and step out, allow you to move one line at a time. But sometimes you just want to skip over a whole bunch of stuff and go to a specific line. So there's another new feature in 1.0 called Run to Line, um, which is there in the right-click menu. But what I find even, even more convenient there is you can just, if you happen to have a middle click or a middle ma mouse button, or uh, if you don't, you can just hold down Control and click. Uh, on the line that you want to run to. And it'll actually just run. You can see the arrow move directly to that line. Let me do that again. So I want to go to this line, so I'm just going to click on it. Uh, another thing you might not know, if you're used to um, using debuggers like Microsoft Visual Studio in particular, uh, most people who've used that debugger are addicted to the, uh, the uh, F10 and F11 keyboard shortcuts and begged me for them in the previous version, which didn't have them. So if you happen to have that habit, um, in version 1.0, those keys do actually do what you would expect. Uh, another thing that people have asked me for a lot, which is new in this version, is the ability to move to a specific line to search for, uh, to jump to a line number. Uh, this is not the most discoverable feature, but the way that it works is you just go here into the search box in the script tab, and you just type the pound sign and the number, the line number that you want to go to. It'll jump you right to it. Um, a lot of people email me and and ask me how to search in the um, just for plain text in this list, and probably it's because they expect to be able to use Command F, which is sort of hijacked by the browser. So Command-Shift-K is the equivalent of Command-F, and that'll focus this box here. And you can type whatever it is you want to search for. And to find next, you just hit Enter. And you can see it's going to cycle through and just loop around to move to the next instance of that match. So Command-Shift-K and Enter. What I might think about doing um, is when, you're, when you de um, detach Firebug and put in a separate window like this, then I don't have the browser's uh, keyboard shortcuts to deal with. And maybe I can support uh, Control F there like everybody, everybody expects. Now, one, one other thing that people who have big JavaScript apps have asked me for here is um, the ability to 
jump to a specific file. Um, I actually imp implemented this just for the guys at Zimbra because they have like 300 or 500, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, JavaScript files in their uh, email app. And so finding them in this list here was just out of control. Uh, it's not quite as vivid here with um, YUI, but if you look at the list of files here, they're, uh, they're grouped by subdirectory. Uh, and if you, um, when you have this list open, you can just start typing. And if I typed LO, like I did just there, it filters the list by files that match, and then you can just uh, hit enter to jump to that file. If you're, um, if you're a user of uh, Quicksilver, like I am, then uh, another nice sort of addendum to that is that you can hit uh, Command Shift and Space, or Control Shift Space on Windows to actually open this up, and then just start typing. So it's a nice, real, nice shortcut if you're a, a keyboard guy to move around between files there in the script tab. Another way that you can navigate the JavaScript files is actually in a, this tab here, the DOM tab. The DOM tab shows all the, initially it shows you all the properties of the window object, which are essentially global variables. Um, what it does, which is new, is that it separates built-in variables from variables that you defined in your JavaScript. You can see here in, in uh, this file that in bold here at the top are things that um, YUI actually added to the namespace and non-bolded down here are the standard built-in um, properties of the window that Firefox adds in. Uh, so you can, uh, you can expand these um, and this gives you a, a, another nice way to navigate your JavaScript because if you're thinking about how you've organized your functions in terms of the actual um, objects here, you can see the functions and click on them uh, right here and it'll jump you over to uh, their place in the source. So anywhere you see a function, anywhere in Firebug, you can click on it like that to take you to the, the actual source code. Okay, and one more little JavaScript trick I want to show you um, in regards to the command line. The command line now allows you to expand it to um, this little box here, which lets you uh, edit longer snippets of code. Um, what I find is that a lot of times I'm editing something and I want to test it out real quick. So I copy it and I flip over here to Firebug and I want to paste it in. A nice little shortcut here is you can just, if you paste something into the command line, um, which has line breaks in it, it'll just automatically flip you over to here with the, uh, with the text in there. Uh, once you're in there, to actually run the, the code, you actually just hit Control Enter as opposed to enter since enter in this mode inserts line breaks. And if you happen to be uh, the type of person who writes, writes uh, bookmarklets, you'll, uh, you'll really like this because you can hit this copy button down here and it will um, crunch everything together as a, uh, a bookmarklet that you can then just paste right into your URL bar to execute it or create a bookmarklet from it. It's pretty handy. Uh, any more questions at this point? She just mentioned Joe just got an IM from somebody live saying, I heart Firebug. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being able to share. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, the last part of this talk, I'm going to um, talk about the um, console logging feature, which is why I created Firebug in the first place, actually, because uh, if you've ever used log debugging, uh, it's really a nice way to get information out of your program more quickly in some cases than using a debugger. So I'm just going to show you a few things you can do with log debugging that a lot of people don't know about, which are very handy. So in this autocomplete um, example here, <laughs> take this stuff out. In this populate list function, which I showed you earlier, which is used to um, populate the results of the autocomplete query, um, if I happen to get the query and at that point not really know what I'm dealing with and I want to see what the value is or what's going on with this uh, variable called oself, what you can do is you can just call console.log with oself. It's an object, um, but what it does is it doesn't actually uh, create a string and log the string. It actually 
what it does is it logs a hyperlink to the object. So when I type here now, you can see it logged right here a link to this object. It even knows that it's a type autocomplete, and it gives you a few of the, um, the properties just kind of for an overview. And now I can click that, and it'll take me over to the DOM tab, and I can see everything that, that uh, is hanging off of that object. So this, at this point, time has passed, and maybe the object has changed since that point in time when console.log was fired. So the values you're seeing there might not reflect what they were right here. So if you want to see the properties at that point, instead of using console.log, you can use um, a function called console.dir, D-I-R. So now when, when I call that over here, it's actually going to log all the properties of the object at that specific moment uh, using basically the same um, expandable tree control that the DOM tab uses. So these properties, if you expand any of these objects here, you'll see what the object is, um, again, live, as opposed to these values here, which reflect what they were at the time that this was called. Um, and one final thing, which is also pretty handy in these situations, is um, the debugger will show you a stack trace, which is you know the stack of functions that were being called at the moment that the debugger was stopped. But sometimes you want to see um, what um, when you're debugging something. Sometimes you're curious who's calling a function that gets called frequently, and you stopping in the debugger you know 50 times isn't really practical. So what you can do is you can just add this console.trace anywhere. In this, in this particular example here, I'm going to put in get style, which is a frequently called function. And now when I reload the page, you can see it. It shows me initially get style was called by log reader, which was called by init. And all the uh, arguments to the each function are also included here. Again, hyperlinked. You know, as I continue to interact with the page, get style continues to be called, and you can continue to keep on, on track with who's calling it. Um, this is sort of a, a nice complement to the profiling tool because the profiling tool is just a flat table of functions um, that and shows you what's accumulated over time, whereas this shows you actually what happened on a per-function basis each time it was called. And uh, that's the end of my highlight reel. Any other questions at this point? Uh, can you edit values in, uh, when you're debugging in the watch pane? Yeah, yes you can. You can, um, back over here. Uh, if you didn't hear it, oh, you probably did. He has a mic. I'm going to repeat it. Um, here in this on most mouse over tab function, I'll set a breakpoint. And, yeah, what you can do if you want to edit one of these um, existing properties, you can just double click it. Um, for instance, yeah. yeah, you just double click it and uh, you can change it to anything right there. And uh, like I said earlier with the uh, watch editor, these are this uh, little view supports autocomplete as well. It's nice to keep in mind. This uh, that editing feature works the same way in the DOM tab too. You can. You can right-click um, and anything to see some of your editing options, or you can just double-click it to just bring the editor right up like that. Question over here. Uh, do you do a JavaScript syntax validation? No, no, not yet, not yet. A lot of people want that, though, so, yeah. Is there any uh, keyboard shortcut for the inspect? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I've been using that all throughout this presentation. I didn't tell you. It's um, Control Shift C or Command Shift C on the Mac. Um, just a warning that the uh, web developer extension you, has that set by default, so there's a bit of a conflict there. You can go into Web Developer though and change it if you weren't already addicted to that particular one in, in Web Developer. If you were, then you can email me to complain and. Maybe I'll change it. Firefox um, keyboard extensions are a problem because with all the extensions, um, they, uh, they tend to conflict. I've heard rumors that there's uh, internal APIs that get to these Yes, yes, there are. Um, 
Uh, I can't talk about that, no. Um, no, yes, there are. Actually, uh, Steve uh, Satters here has been working on uh, the first ever extension for Firebug, so it's like an extension to an extension. Um, <laughs> but yes, there is an API that uh, allows you to add your own t uh, permanent tabs to Firebug, so after the net tab here. And uh, documentation is forthcoming on how to do that. Is there anything uh, you had in mind? Just curious? Um, first of all, a statement, I just want to say thank you, and probably on behalf of everybody in this room. Thank you. Could, you could sell this thing for $1,000, and I'd give you a check at the end of this <laughs> presentation. As far as that. It's amazing. My Thanks. question was about profiling. Is there a way to um, have this thing automatically start when you load a page? So let's say I'm on some site, and I want to see just what's running, and I have it automatically start. You can, you can start it before you load the page, and then when you actually load the page, oops, move that. when you actually load the page, it'll, it'll show the data from the, the very first point when the page started loading. So, it's, Thank you. yeah. So, will there be some way in the future to integrate with text rates? Like yes, actually. Um, I use TextMate myself, you probably noticed. So I really want that. Um, the uh, good folks at a company called Optana, which you may have heard of, have been working on something. They got ahead of me on this. They actually want to integrate Firebug with their text editor. So they've actually, they're actually contributing code to make that happen. It'll be somewhat generic. So once that stabilizes, I am going to make it work for TextMate. Oh, sure. Uh, Firebug Lite is, um, was, um, I have to, the disclaimer on Firebug Lite, it, it was kind of a half a day hack to, uh, to uh, answer the question people are constantly asking me, which is, how do I use this for Internet Explorer? Um, <laughs> so um, the, the, the current utility of Firebug Lite is, if you happen to use all those console logging functions in your code, and you want those to actually work in IE or Safari or Opera, then Firebug Lite will, it will actually show a little bar at the bottom of, on those browsers and show the output from those functions. But it doesn't do... You know, as soon as people got their hands on that, of course, the next thing you want is you want you know the rest of Firebug to work in those browsers, and that's a little bit more work. So it's open source. <laughs> I'm waiting. And, uh, thank you, Joe, very much. Thank